very much. I've been hearing so much about MAMA throughout the years, so I'm quite happy to be here and uh, also under the auspices of uh, Osran. And uh, um, I'm going to go through a series of uh, quite known examples. Some will have a visual, others won't and uh, many of those you will know and uh, if not I think it's also nice to have a, simply a mental reconstruction of uh, the implication that they may have and uh, uh, I have a little theori theoretical point here and there especially at the beginning but I try to keep that part also a little bit condensed and uh, actually to enter on the most abstract part uh, if I would have to put it in a formula uh, I would say that what I, what I would like to talk about is somehow strictly a part of nothing or more precisely we can say an element or a facet of the void and uh, my idea would be that uh, if I can manage uh, to present this aspect or element or facet of the void this part of nothing I would have not present less the nothing, literally a part of the nothing, but somewhat, somehow more than it. And in fact, what one, this is a bit my idea, obtains by presenting a piece of nothing or a component of the void is to show that nothing or void has many parts. And it is hence far more articulated or complex that what the alleged simplicity of the com concept of nothing or of the concept of the void as something which is simply nothing or without elements would seem to entail. Um, just to give a bit of uh, frame, the presentation that I would like to do is a part of a long-term project on the history of the void and on the history of that which is not, and uh, more precisely uh, on the history of the void on the 20th century, that uh, is called Fiat Vacuum, and that uh, Osran and I are carrying on since some time. The aim of the project is to investigate how the idea of the void seems radically to change in the last century. In this sense, we have scrutinized several singular moments within the arts, within science and politics, in which the void stops to appear as a simply lack or simply as an absence, or as an interval allowing for the ordered distribution of that which is, the void as that which is between something and something else, and on the contrary starts to appear as a paradoxical presence. A presence of something that the situation in which it appears does not name or does not recognize, but that still has a certain effectivity, a presence and an effectivity in the situation. And despite this diversity of material, our intention in this project is not to make a philosophy of these practices, a philosophy of art, a philosophy of science and of politics, or to explain the meaning of the historical development of these practices during the century. Rather, our aim is to see how philosophy shapes its own interiority, becomes able to produce new conceptual articulation to do its own work, under condition of some singular moments uh, and which more, are more precisely moment of breaks that take place within other practices. Moments of breaks that for different reasons for philosophy to think differently and hence to shape its own interiority. So the idea is that philosophy is a practice which is the production of concepts that has more chances to take place under the condition of some moment of radical interruption that happen outside of it. And somehow we map a bit some of these moments. And the question is how does this apply to the problem of the void? Placed somewhere between a constellation of quite defined concepts, nothing, the negative, non-being, etc., which receive a precise place within philosophy, the void appears rather within philosophy as a source, I would say, of spurious formation or unclear formation, which is inseparable from the history of philosophy. The void returns in philosophy quite often since Aristotle, at least, but that somehow at the same time does not receive in, inside philosophy a clear place and a clear definition. This, at least since the scientific turn, one can say, of the 17th century, which has separated philosophy and science. 
What I would like to attempt is uh, to show, let's say, what, what would be the piece of the void that I would like to show, is how a series of singular moments in the art in which a certain manipulation of the void is coupled with an explosive idea of how to do it, of how to make some void, namely via destruction, offer a radical different grasp of one of the problems that have tormented philosophy at least for the last 185 years, I'll leave you the why of the date, namely the problem of the determin determining role of the negative. My point of departure today will be to analyze a series of moments to arts that do have nothing in common between them. A series of heterogeneous examples in which the presence of something which is not becomes central, namely because it produces a transformation. More precisely, in these cases that we are going to see, a certain appearance of nothing sheds some light on the following classical question. How it is possible to account for change in such a way that the, the change is not reduced to a simple permutation, a change of the order of the elements? The change of position of elements within a structure that distributes and hierarchizes position. How it is possible, in other terms, to understand what is a qualitative or a radical change. The question of the void and the question of the relation between destruction and the void exactly hits to the point of the difference between radical transformation and transformation meant as an uh, interchange of elements. The idea that a change other than the simple structural permutation between elements by, might be coupled with a certain appearance of nothing, with a term that is not, is of course to be found, one can find it, in the idea of the proletarians, who as the French translation that I like a lot of the uh, international Athens says, uh, are nothing and become all. Nous ne sommes uh, rien soyons tout. But it is also to be found in the case of insignificant peasants who are not supposed to be represented in art outside the tableau de genre, the representation of the labor, of the festivity of uh, peasants getting drunk, and that all at once strike a hieratic pose in a six by four meter big majestic painting, which is the format normally reserved to kings or to mythological scenes. In both cases, this is Courbet, in politics and in art, a radical change is connected with the appearance of something of the order of the nothing, or something that has no recognizable characters within the field in which it appears. In the case of Courbet painting, this nothing appears as an inconsistency, and a quite big one, six by four meters, but this inconsistency is the inconsistency between the cause of a genre and the subject matter. Properly, the subject of this painting is a nonsense, a void of relation, an absence of relation between form and the portrayed subject matter. And uh, uh, the subject of the painting, thus, we can say, is not simply or that much the peasants that we see appearing here. The subject of the painting, rather, is the very lack or absence of relation between the, pain, the uh, peasants represented and the cause of the genre of painting in which it appears, this type of hieratic, majestic uh, painting. Here, the subject, in this sense, is an absence of relation, a lack. It is a pure nothing. And when nothing does that which is not supposed to do, which is not to be there, it does not appear as something, but it appears as a fracture, as a radical change, or at least as a promise or of a possible radical transformation. The no one, the nothing, portrayed in this painting will no longer be the same. After its simultaneous, this is also interesting, its simultaneous appearance in the streets of Paris, 1848, and in this painting, which is 1849. Again, the real subject here is not per se the people, but the presence of an impossible, nonsensical connection. Common people making political statements in the streets, and the 
rubble conquering the center of a majestical portrait, appearing with a calm, dignified, almost hieratic staticity usually applied to the portraits of kings. Such an idea of nothing such an idea of a nothing that appears in a situation, and even more, this is quite a change, in a situation and even more the idea of an absence of relation between an object and a situation, determining a fracture in a situation, will of course become absolutely central after this and all throughout the 20th century. From Duchamp ready-made, an uninteresting object, the obscenity of which mainly consists in the dull banality of being hanged up among supposed groundbreaking artworks. You remember the main point of Duchamp, it, it has been refused by the, refu by the refusé themselves. Up to Manzoni box, the box allegedly containing the shit of Manzoni, in which the absence of any visible excrement breaks the 1960s obligation to scandalize. And again, what really is groundbreaking is not the shit in uh, the box, the alleged shit, but the fact that you cannot see it. And among contemporary examples, I would like to mention the work of Charlemagne Palestine, in which this logic of the presence of that which is not, and of an irrelation with canons and expectation, seems to expand up to a rich and multifaceted way. A random group totally random group of teddy bears, the sad banality of which goes clearly against the grain of that sense for beauty that is still present in the history of the ready-made and of the objet trouvé. A lot have been uh, written about a certain beauty of the Ori Noir and a certain appeal of the simplicity of the form that here you have no longer any relation with this remainder of an aesthetic sense. So this random group of teddy bear of uninteresting object is present, but not, does not strike this time any hieratic pose, nor occupies any defined pictorial or, scu or uh, sculptorial genre. It is not interfering even in any genre. And quasi-cultural composition, but not really. They serve as a frame for a constantly postponed performance. Palestine is known for almost delaying the moment in which the performance will take place, in which the oscillating indecision between two absolutely identical glasses of wine sets the tempo for a constantly delayed piano and voice performance. And again, he will do it. Here he continues with this scene of the two glasses which will finally take place, this performance of piano, only to linger between thrumming and minimalistic music. And just to show you a little piece of this. interrupting himself constantly and constantly and again and again and again. So what he does is an almost installation, an almost performance, an almost music. And so this almost installation, almost performance and almost music, this place of suspension produced by Palestine works creates a time and a space populated of objects, of sounds and gestures, all alike, all equal. The quality of which makes of them a sort of flat nothing, inconsistently with the highly structured universe of music, of performance, and of sculpture. And yet, 
the flattening of aesthetic values that they perform, the dragging of everything into nothing that they perform, progressively brings forward, if one would have the time to stay in the performance, an articulated universe, as if the void of sense presented by the dull characters of Courbet funeral started to weave their way out of the frame, expanding towards a new grammatical sense. The, even the breaking of the reference with the structure that they supposedly deny becomes this sort of complete equalization of all gestures, of all uh, sounds, and of all uh, object in the space that by simply getting to the closest level of nothing, little by little builds its own grammar of sense. These examples manifest for me a certain relation between the appearance of a void of sense and the appearance of change. Now, the theme of such a correlation of nothing and change has been central in the last philosophical century. Namely, the idea of a certain presence, of a certain effectivity and materiality of that which is not, appears to be exactly that via which the attempt is posed to overcome what is called the limits of the logic of the negative. One of the central questions throughout the 20th century uh, of philosophy, but also, for instance, in Italy's 60s and 70s political debates, concerned, the fa in fact, the limits of determinate negation, the limits of thinking negation as that which ultimately affirms that which is supposed to negate. Explain myself. The, the question is raised of the negative as that which produces further determination allowing for a better and more precise operational capacity of the structure in which the negation takes place. For instance, left opposition as the negative of governmental right finally affirms the very common ground of parliamentary turnover, turnover while at the same time giving arguments and then strengthening the government's capacity to face critique. So the negative as the terminated negative at once uh, supports the existence of a common ground with that which is supposed to negate and gives argument to that which is supposed to negate. Then it strengthens it twice. And philosophy has been constantly stressing the need to overcome such determining moment of the negative in order for a true novelty, be it scientific, in thought, political or aesthetic, to appear. But each time, philosophy seems to hit on a double bind. Either the appearance of nothing is resorbed within the logic and the structural figure of the negative, or it becomes sheer destruction, a sort of nihilist drive. Many have, of course, been the attempt to overcome this double bind, from the idea of autonomia operaia in the 70s to the idea of subtraction in Badiou or the concept of pure positivity in Deleuze that we are not going to investigate here. I would nonetheless like to stress how one of the most articulated attempts to overcome this problem is developed within the arts, thus possibly pushing philosophy towards a different understanding of how to get out of this predicament. In the examples that we have seen, a certain nothing appears as unrelated with the situation in which it appears. Courbet painting might certainly be a social critique, and they have an aspect of social critique. And, uh, uh, but first and foremost, that painting is an irrelation or an inconsistency, an irrelation between form and subject matter portrayed, developing its own language starting from this inconsistency, is the articulation of this fracture or, or inconsistency. Irrelation in Courbet or the logic of the almost almost work of art in Palestine, posit a nothing, a void, which is at once destructive and positive. It is destructive because its paradoxical, paradoxical appearance threatens the valid, validity of the organizational log logic of the field in which it appears. It is a painting that should not exist as a painting, for instance. But at the same time, this type of work are constructive. They are not only destructive, because the appearance of such a nothing tends to organize itself in radically new forms. Nous ne sommes rien, soyons tout, means nothing can become everything. This is, of course, the promise of a new world to come. But such a nothing that appears also threatens to drag into nothingness everything. All should be destroyed. It is a promise of a new world and a promise of a destruction at the same time. 
Being at once so destructive and constructive, the appearance of such nothing overcomes twice the logic of the negative. First, as seen in Courbet or in Palestine, nothing appears as, an, as in an existence that produces a nonsense that immediately saturates the situation with its paradoxical presence, a presence which the former logic of the situation cannot come to terms with. They're both very massive work, in a way. Secondly, although appearing as explosive critiques this, by destructive means, it is not the past destruence, the negative moment, to which a new constructive moment will follow. Novelty is not a new order coming after a destructive moment. When novelty is, or when not something new appears, it is absolutely positive. It is a nothing that becomes directly constructive, constructive within its destructive practice. The work of Palestine is constantly almost doing nothing. This doing nothing is not a prelude to something else. It is the work of art itself. In this sense, my claim would be that, to bring out other stuff, silence in cage music, destruction in Mata Clark and architecture, or the void of, voidance of image in Malevich painting did not appear as negative moments via which the logic underlying harmonic structures can be extended to further domains, by which the solidity of architecture can find more subtle expressive means, or via which the pictorial narrative based on adequation between style and object of representation can be taken further to another level of complicacy. All this moment appears as fatal inconsistency in the art grammar of their own time. Even more, they all meant at introducing a new idea of art as the articulation of a conflictual space in which that which is not, that which is not supposed to exist into art, appears in art as a nothing which reduces to nothing the very mode of organization and of perception of what the space of art is. In other words, radical destruction is the absence of image in Malevich is not meant as the storm after which the construction of a new language will, will be possible, but as a destructive act of voiding which is immediately equated to the construction of novelty. There is not like, a, okay, let's make some room, let's make silence in music, let's eliminate image, and then we will find new expressive way. They are already this act of destruction that which produces a novelty. And I would like to show how this novelty from an act of destruction can develop from within. And here we go to the examples. Among several examples of the introduction of an inexistence, something that does not exist, with that once produces an effect of destruction and posits a radical novelty, it can be of interest to focus on some aspect of the use of the void and of silence in Cage's work, John Cage. It is known how Cage dignified silence by bringing it to the role of a musical object. Cage makes of silence a musical object by simply asking the performer not to perform, for instance. But it can be interesting here to remark a few qualifications that in his uh, theoretical writing he uses for silence and that allow to see how silence is introduced not because it will be a certain flatness, a sheer absence of sound, so avoidance of sound, but because it is an articulated presence which rather flattens or silences the customary ordinary structure and organizational relevances upon which music is constituted. Cage, first and foremost, remarks that silence far from being inert or unarticulated, expresses within written music that which does not find place in the writing, yet being there. It's a very strange expression. In written music, Cage explained, I quote him, those sounds which are not notated appear as silences, which is a very strange expression. What does it mean that in written music, a sound which is not notated appears as silence? Silence, the void of music, 
is the specific mode of appearance of those sounds that are not recognized as music. I will go to, to what it means. Cage point is the following. What any musical grammar fundamentally does, no matter which one, a musical form of notation or musical grammar, is to constantly select sounds, categorizing between musical sounds and non-musical sounds, thus fundamentally silencing the second ones, the allegedly non-musical sounds, which appear, and this is his point, in the page as the white blank separating no, no, uh, notes or other musical graphemes. So the idea of cage is that basically there is sound, there is music going on, there is a series of sounds going on, and what the musical sheet does is to select within existing sound, and that which is not recognizable as musical sound appears as a white in the page. And he intervenes in this and reverses this logic, and then one can think, reversing this logic, one can think of silence as the possible performance of these sounds, of the sounds that have been in the blank of the page. Namely, Cage continuance, continues, in live performance, silence is that latency where random environmental sounds can appear. When performed on stage, silence not only works as the destruction of music, it's a destruction of music because with, when silence is performed, music is not there, as its effective erasure of music. But it's, it also allows for the appearance of the sounds of a chair squeaking, of a cough, cough from the audience, of the heavy and soft breathing of the performance, or even the screaming of protest of a bored audience, and as in a well-known case, the political slogans and the songs of an audience singing against Cage, but also with Cage, of the need of getting rid of these avant-garde bourgeois artists. So, by making of silence a musical object, Cage manages at saturating, actually, the musical field with an overwhelming mass of allegedly non-musical elements. This is the extract from a performance in Milan, of which I don't give you the uh, technical detail, but there was basically nothing happened for three hours. And, of course, at the beginning you hear the chair squeaking, the coughing, but it was also a very specific historical moment. It was the 70s. And so at a certain point people start protesting, they get on, on the scene, they start saying that uh, this is degenerate avant-garde art, and they engage an uh, enduring battle, which is exactly what uh, Cage wanted. So by uh, actually, by simply performing silence, the space gets more and more saturated with all that that is not supposed to be on stage, and that not only becomes audible as music on the stage, like when someone is moving the chair, but it actually invades literally the, 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 the stage. You see, like, the performance of silence becomes literally an hyper-saturated field. Here we hit again on the idea of the overcoming of the negative and of its determining function. Silence, in fact, has no longer to do anything with the negative of music. As Cage explains, silence is no longer meant, and I quote him, as the time lapse between sounds, useful towards a variety of senses, among them that of tasteful arrangement, whereby separating two sounds or two groups of sound, their differences of, or their relation may receive an emphasis. Quite the contrary, the whole point of silence, if one notices, is that the attempt to produce silence introduces noisy disturbances in the musical scene. It introduces what I would call a hypersaturated field of sonic phenomena, which not only immediately self-organize in new musical forms, but by self-organizing, also organize new action of aggression against taste, against genre, against sense, and other forms of organized division of sonic phenomena. Silence is thus a nothing that actually empties itself of its own only quality, i.e. to be silent. So you see, silent is a nothing that, when performed, is not silent, but empties itself of the, its own quality of silence. So it self-destructs somehow by performing something. And immediately one can see that silence brings forth two fundamental aspects of any contemporary radical grasp of the void as a functional concept. To have a certain materiality, it is something, and to have a certain efficacy, 
it does something, it pro produces something. Being no longer that space of absence of sound that allows for the rhythmic, tonal, and timbric distinction of sounds, silent loses its negative functions and changes of sign. That which was the negative of music, allowing for its determinations, you see the language that we had on the philosophical part, appears as a field saturated with phenomena which are all allegedly irreceivable in music. By actively produ producing a flattening and indifferentiation of the musical field, it allows for the manifestation of that which, present in music, receives normally no representation in music. It allows for the creation of new musical phenomena, making a difference within music. It makes difference by indifferentiation. This is the trick that it performs. Making difference by indifferentiation, constructing music by destroying it, by silencing it, the point becomes to equate destruction with a constructive narration of this destruction. You see, it narrates his own destruction. That's why it's not a past instruments after which you have a construction. It creates his own narrative of destruction. In this sense, and I think it's interesting this point, Cage remarks how the point in creating an empty space allowing for silen uh, silence the sonic phenomena to be exposed is not simply to remove artificial structure in order to show some allegedly deeper truth of music, but it is to give room to those elements which, in a precise historical moment or sequence, can be used to construct new destructive strategies. This performance has sense in the 70s. It doesn't have sense in another moment. It is there that that specific silence does something. Cage is in, is in this sense very attentive in introducing criteria of selection between the random appearance of sounds brought up by silence. And I quote him, at the parting of the ways where it is realized that sound occur whether intended or not, what we were saying before, there is always sound, one has to turn in the direction of those that he does not intend. End of the quote. Performance needs to select those acts or those sounds or those specific moment of intervention of silence which are able to drag with them further unintentional elements, further disturbances and chances, thus creating new impediment, new hijacking of the role of the composer, of the audience and of the performer. So you have a indifferentiation in which something appears randomly and in that, you do activate a selection, but you select that which produces further hijacking of the selective and active. So you have an active moment in which you select that which goes against activity. This is the paradoxical trick. And amongst all Cage's system of randomization, for instance, prepared piano, the use of I Ching, he has a lot of different things. One can quote a strategy that is created directly at the level of writing that I like a lot. As he explains, the idea is to set a system in which, I quote him, notes are determined by the imperfection of the paper upon which the music is written. Paper here, the white paper, is no longer the negative, the white nothing upon which the sonic graphemes can be determined in their mutual relation. You have a paper and you determine distance between signs, not necessarily notes. It is rather a nothing of sense provided with a specific materiality, actively disturbing the act of writing. So you select a paper which is, has, is not flat. And actively disturbing the act of writing, actively disturbing the dialectics that distributes musical signs through the mediation of their negative, through the mediation of the blank page. So you have a blank page that hijacks his role of distanciator of sounds. Even more, this use of the blank page unfolds and gives a further twist to the logic of the material and effective use of silence. In this sense, in the same way in which silence brought forward its equivalence with a hypersaturated field of noise, as we have seen, the imperfection of the blank page that Cage notes is the same that silence in traditional music, are here used to perform a, former, a further hijacking of the difference between music and non-music. 
The materiality of the blank page produces a series of paradoxical musical notation, which are, which are literally the sound of the blank, the sound of silence. The errors produced by the paper are somehow the sound imposed by the allegedly negative of music. And these sounds, which are produced by the materiality of this blank, diminish the activity of the author and impose to the performer that noise that in other composition cage brought up by the uh, performance of silence. Cage's use of the blank page brings forward the logic of silence and it adds a new function that expands the narrative started by the performance of silence. There is an attempt to go on and on with a sort of grammar of destruction or grammar of nothing. The materiality of silence, the fact that silence is in fact a field saturated with possible noises, is here not only manifested but constructed. In performing silence, you manifest silence. Here, you construct it somehow. And the elements of this construction, the elements composing the narrative of this construction, are nothing else than the techniques allowing for the destruction of music. Here, precisely, the destruction of the difference between blank sign, black sign, and blank page. By this means, Cage brings about a grammatic of destruction, one can call it, that is immediately equivalent to the construction of a new mu musical space. Here, I think one can see what I was previously announcing. By overcoming the dialectics of the negative, the blank page and the signs, the destructive capacity of nothing is no longer a moment to be overcome. There is no overcoming of the zero moment. It is not the parse the instruments to which a parse construence then will follow. Ah, we, make, we erase old musical history by not performing, then let's do something else. No, it's not this that Cage is doing. It's creating a new grammar starting from the gesture of destruction. There is no restoration of the musical field after its destruction, because the destruction of the musical field is here equivalent to its construction. And uh, I think that it's interesting to see how there is always a constant attempt to go against this. And for instance, in cage music, to stabilize the sounds that can be accepted as uh, random sounds. So there is like, these are the sounds that cage performed as unintentional. But this is exactly the one thing that is not supposed to happen. And although these examples show a possible internal constructive logic of destruction, still I think that there is a further step in, in this. And uh, Boris Groys, who uh, you will uh, receive here, in, made a brilliant article on Kazimir Malevich. And uh, he has correctly highlighted how the kernel of these problems lies in the question of the consequences. And uh, in this sense, he stresses that the, um, by building a parallelism between political revolution and artistic revolution, he claims that uh, Malevich gets into a predicament. And what he writes is, the continuation of the revolution could be understood as its permanent radicalization, as its repetition, as the permanent revolution. So after a revolutionary moment, a moment of radical destruction, one can think of continuing the revolution by bringing it on and on and on and performing new act of revolution. But, I still quote him, repetition of the revolution under the condition of the post-revolutionary state could at the same time easily be understood as counter-revolution, as an act of weakening and destabilizing revolutionary achievement. On the other hand, the stabilization of the post-revolutionary situation unavoidably revives the pre-revolutionary norm of stability and norms of order. Groys fundamentally um, tries to, to see a, a very classic uh, situation. What to do after the revolution? Should we simply say, okay, um, when a revolution occurs, should we simply continue in this path and then 
end in a sort of nihilist drive, or should we establish a new structure and a new form of state? And uh, basically what he claims is that um, what Malevich does is to fall exactly in this predicament when he paints Black Square. And uh, um, and uh, sorry. And he reads Black Square within the frame of this predicament, because Black Square is like the minimal reduction to the zero image. And he reads it within this predicament as the revolutionary attempt to get rid of the old, but an attempt that fails to overcome the deadlock of the question, how to continue. He says, like, basically, Malevich arrives to a point of pure the painting, but he has no idea of how to continue after the de-painting, after the zero form. And uh, uh, he claims this by arguing that actually, and it's true, Malevich, after arriving at the point of just painting a black square, reintroduces forms of uh, classical representation of figurativism. It is my belief that Groys misses here the essential point. Malevich's work exactly escapes the double bound of how to continue, and it does so by a specific reason. And this is because the destructive moment in uh, Malevich's work is not the parse denstruence, the moment of destruction, posited between the old form to be destroyed and the promise of a new art. But it is itself identical to the construction of novelty, but in a more complex way, if possible, than what we have seen with Cage. In fact, Black's, Black Square, on the one hand, is not equal to uh, sheer destruction, and on the other, it does not interact or mend figurativism, nor it is meant to be followed by a constructive mo moment after age. What Malevich rather is doing is to indicate the possibility of a positive constructivity of destruction itself. And I think that one can see this because Malevich doubled the voidance of all figure, figure performed by Black Square with a more radical form of iconoclasm, of destruction of the images. And in fact, in the same years, facing the risk that artworks in the Russian Museum would be burned or destroyed by the insurrection uh, in the aftermath of the revolution by a group of activists, wrote the following and I quote Malevich, where there is a striving to destroy, one must not interfere, since by hindering we are blocking the path to novelty. It is more or less in the same years just after the revolution. So it says on the one hand it depains, and on the other hand he says, if there is a strive to destroy, the artist should not intervene and let the works be destroyed. And more in interesting he adds, and I quote him again, in burning a corpse, we obtain one gram of powder. Accordingly, thousands of graveyards could be accommodated on a single chemist shelf. He's, here he's talking about the corpses of the uh, works of art eventually burned in the museum. Pot of ashes by pot of ashes, shelf by shelf, one can imagine to build up a whole pharmacy, the image that he uses of the chemist, made of the burned corpses of the ancient painting. The reduced space of this would also let somehow quite literally more space for novelty. And again, I'm quoting, the aim of this pharmacy will be the following. If people will examine the powder from Rubens, the powder of works eventually burned by Rubens and all his art, a mass of ideas will arise in people and will be often more alive than actual representation and will take less room. And I think there is here a different logic than the one of a moment of destruction, the physical elimination of the representative art that supported the bourgeois class of system, and a constructive part, the pharmacy as this image of the new art that will cure or mend the people and allow to create the new humanity to come. By reading together this declaration and the gesture of Black Square, 
one can see that the proper artwork, this would be my, my point, the proper artwork is not per se black square, nor it is the, the following coming back as for a certain uh, figurativism that takes place in Malevich. Black square is neither the minimal form of the artwork once and for all achieved, the ultimate artwork, the painting, nor a destructive moment after which we can do new art. I think that what is to be read as the proper consistency of Malevich artwork is a sequence of gestures unfolding, proliferating from within the moment of voidance or the claim for destruction. One, from the black square proceeds the idea of depainting, this is clear, of taking painting up to the minimal sensible trace of its own blockage, is the one gesture before stop painting. Two, from the painting as materialized the idea of depainting, is the minimal trace of the stopping of the destruction of the act of painting, of doing nothing, a bit like the silence in cage, proceeds the idea of undoing figurative painting on a larger scale, naming by, namely by letting the painting be burned in the museum. Three, and I think it's fundamental, this expansion of the defiguration from the black paint to the burning of the painting is not obtained by active means, but by inscribing a certain passivity into the core of the definition of the new art. Malevich's request is to let artwork be destroyed, not to have an art artist which is active and goes and becomes the criminal artist, for instance. Four, the coincidence of the passive and of the active, the new art entails a certain passivity, is no longer as it was in the idea of the coincidence of the passive and of the active in the romantic art, an internal struggle of the artist ultimately defining the activity of the artist but it is rather a suspension of the artist's, artist's powers and of its individuality. What here counts is the destructive capacity of the masses, active in the point where the artist stops to work. And five, finally, this is what produces a certain pharmacy, which is not to be read as simply the capacity to heal the stupidity of the masses by a supposed, supposed medical role of the artist Taumaturg. What is here at stake is rather the capacity of the masses themselves to combine the different powders that are to be found in the shelves of destruction. There is no artist who will cure the masses from their bourgeois ideology with the new art. It's the art acts of the destructive capacity of the masses themselves that become self-curative. All this chain of consequences is what constitutes the constructivity of destruction, is what constitutes the capacity, I quote Malevich, to construct creation by erasing the path behind us. It's a, a sentence that I like a lot because he basically claimed that you don't construct, the aim is no longer to construct new works, but to construct creation. But you only construct creation by erasing. So you only construct new form as long as you erase. But of course, this can only happen if erasing is able to produce its own narrative, have different layers, and be structured somehow, find its own structure. And here we witness the capacity of an artwork, an artwork which is equivalent to annihilation, and even to its own annihilation, to produce a chain of consequences. And I think that it is exactly the possibility to establish a chain of consequences like this from an act of destruction, within an act of destruction, that has to be called artwork. And to go towards the conclusion, um, I would like to point out how the capacity for destruction to directly produce novelty to create a set of articulated consequences within its destructive moment can be found in a more complex relation between moments of voidance and moments of saturation. We have seen already a bit that there is a sort of paradoxical correspondence between making the void and producing an hypersaturation, like in the case of a Cage. That's why I like so much that image. And. Uh, um, 
The, cre um, the creative capacity of destruction can be obtained when an act of voidance saturates a field with paradoxical or inexistent elements. Or, so, there is a creative capacity of destruction, not only when you have destruction, but when destruction let appear a field of hypersaturated field of elements that tend to organize themselves. But also, I think, when a collapse, a destruction, is produced by means of accumulation. The idea, for instance, that a radical fracture can be obtained by means of accumulation of individual coherent signs, so you don't destroy by enlarging the void, but by accumulating signs that actually make sense. Uh, find of, I think, one of its seminal examples in Steve Reich's spoken word plays uh, piece Come Out from 1966. I'm not going to play it, it's 13 minutes, it would only make sense by playing it all, but I can describe it somehow. By using an over-recording technique that in the same years Alvin Lucia, that we see here, was experimenting on, Reich takes one voice sample that just says Come Out which is one voice sample, is one discrete signal understandable under different analytic angles and progressively overlays to itself. So it just takes this come out that I can understand as a sound, that I can understand as an almost musical element, that I can understand as a spoken word which a sen with a sense it doesn't say much but it says something and it just repeats it and overlays to itself. But it overlays it by introducing a constantly increasing interval between the samples. The shift or the silence between the sample with the proceeding of the piece increases progressively. As, and it also over records it. As the over recordings increase in number, and as the void fracture between the samples increases in duration, so you have an element superposed to itself, so two channels, and they progressively shift but then they become also 4, 6, 8, 16 channels. So as the elements shift and increase in number, on the one hand the signal, by accumulating to itself, degrades into noise. Of course, you can imagine, you accumulate, 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 this come out, it degrades into noise. But on the other hand, a series of new musical phenomena emerge from this progressive de degradation. So you have these masses of an element superposed to itself, and the piece shifts towards sheer noise. But as the piece proceeds, you hear new things appearing. One can hear a spoken word acquiring an echo, so it acquires a corpus somehow, up to the point of creating what we hear as a mu musically notated sound. You can hear almost notes. One can hear pulses and then rhythms uh, and rhythm structure appearing and sinking because the sound shifts and at a certain point you hear a beat, but then this shifts away. You hear cannons forming and dissolving, clarity increasing and finally producing a white noise, the apparent flatness of which is in fact remarkably articulated in a real, I would call it, grammar of noise. Spoken word becomes musical element, becomes musical note, becomes pulse, becomes rhythmic structure, becomes canon, becomes grammar of noise. Again, we have the same generative sequence created around a fracture as we have seen in Malevich. But this time the fracture is introduced together with a cumulative strategy of hypersaturation of signals. You start from a minimal moment of destruction and you amplify it and you create consequences and consequences and consequences, but here by accumulation. Destruction is created by accumulation. Accumulation is obtained by interpolation of nothing but silence. Is one element distantiated by itself by void silence. And the new musical architecture is created by the very process of destruction of the original message. You can't hear the come out words anymore. A double nothing, I think, or double void acts here. On the one hand, the symbol sound come out is separated from itself by a variable quantity of void, the function of which is not to punctuate, but to create noise in the reception of the discrete understandable si uh, signal. So you have the introduction of a void between two elements, but it does exactly the opposite of what it's supposed to do, which is to punctuate sounds. 
On the other hand, the architectural structure of the new, all this complicated construction, proceed in its progressive construction in parallel with the degradation of signal and with the augmentation of noise. The production of this cumulative strategy becomes thus at the same time a program for the destruction of a sonic field and a generative matrix of novelty. The piece, in other words, words performs the narrative of a degradation of signal as the construction of a new complex musical field. To, to, to finish a bit for today uh, about these uh, modes of articulation of voidness and accumulation, I think something which adds a third layer, not only creation of novelty by voidance, creation of novelty by destruction obtained by accumulation, but a bit of a third element that adds to this, I think can be found in uh, uh, Joseph Boyce's work. It is known that Boyce is often accused of uh, contradicting his allegedly anti-authoritarian position that he shared with the Fluxus movement, and this because he puts himself in the place of the master of ceremony. All the works of Boyce have been centered himself at the center as a sort of master of ceremony, of the shaman, of the healer, or of the preacher, all uh, postures that he takes very often in his works. I think this is an argument that needs to be reversed. It is in fact undeniable that Boyce condenses on himself, on rather, or rather on his acting self, a series of symbolic postures that link his work on the one hand to an idea of the pre-romantic symbolic form of representation, and on the other hand, to a form of authority, being himself the performer at the center of the stage, the shaman, the healer, and so on. But exactly this condensation of all these symbols expose him to a double point of failure, and failure would be a bit the third element. First, the different symbols are condensing together in such an overlaid way that they end up becoming inconsistent, a bit like the sounds in uh, uh, Steve Reich. And second, the nice structural circulation of symbols is, sim is like supplemented by a series of material impediments, of malfunctioning, of risk of failure or of rotting, which are generated by the condensation itself. There is like a condensation of symbols we are going to see in which this condensation starts to malfunction and somehow rottens away. I think that this becomes particularly evident in I like America and America likes me. Putting himself in the position of the sick white European man, Boys, upon arrival at New York airport, is transported by ambulance to a gallery where he will be caged with a coyote for a few days. Boys not only displays here the very problematic metaphor of the white man healing from his own sins, namely the extermination of the Native Americans by entering in contact with the forces of nature, here the coyote. Also, he integrates this, me this metaphor in a wider metaphorical circuit, where he puts himself in the role of the shepherd, of the artist as a guide of a stupid humanity reduced to the role of herd. You can see he has a shepherd stick of the shaman, symbolism carried by the appearance of the living sculpture in which he transformed himself. You see him there, it's a sort of mystical shaman. He then adds, so, you know, he's the self-healer, he's the shaman, he's the shepherd, and so on. He then adds a further symbolic layer by letting the coyote pee on a pile of copies of the Wall Street Journal the textuality of which is corroded by the vital fluids of the animal. It, all these things start to be quite annoying when you analyze the work of boys like this. One can thus see here a very problematic metaphoric circuit where the artist, the healer, the shepherd, finally reproduces the same for forms of exploitation and of dominance that he's supposed to reveal and to criticize. But if one looks closer, then he can, she can see that the performance works exactly at the point in which the system of reference, the circuit of symbols fails. First, there is a sort of hermeneutical constipation, I would say, like it's too much, produced by the excessive architecture of symbol. It just doesn't work, it's too much. And second, and I think most important, the one element that was supposed to allow for a good circulation of all these symbols, namely the coyote, is on the contrary completely blocking it, and even blocking it twice. 
and you see it here. And this not only because the coyote introduces chance and randomness, as we have seen in other works, by exposing boys to the risk of a total absence of interaction. The coyote might have not interacted with him. And uh, i.e. by exposing him to the risk that the performance of the encounter of the shaman healer and of the coyote medium will not take place. So the symbol might not work, actually. But also because in the moment in which the encounter effectively takes place, so either the work does not work because there is no interaction of the symbols, or it takes place because they, uh, the encounter takes place, then it works directly against the symbolic articulation of the performance. By shredding the dearest of all boys' material, the felt, which is already quite com complex as a symbolism, problematic, the coyote exposes that boys, the shaman, the healer, the shepherd, is ultimately nothing but an imposter. A stupid man holding together in a precarious situation a collapsing monument of symbols. So you see, it, everywhere it goes, this artwork produces its own failure. By constipation of symbols is too much. By either it doesn't work, so the interaction doesn't happen, or if it happens, the symbols simply are shredded away, and you see an idiot with a cane. And uh, you see it here. Boy's performance does work in the moment in which it hijacks itself, in the moment in which a void or an inconsistency is created starting from an entanglement of symbols, sort, sort of ending in a cacophonic noise. As examples of this idea of accomplishment by failure as a complex form of narrative of destruction, one can also think of Dieter Roth's work composed as a monumental ode to human relations with nature, there are all these plants and so on, in which the nice post-romantic tale of the final union of technology, nature, and art only comes to make sense by an exposure of its constant collapse and process of rotting. You know, maybe the works of Dieter Roth are always on the verge. There are these monumental huge works that might constantly rot away or literally collapse. And you see, quite here how they end up. The idea that a system of sense is ultimately accomplished and transformed into something radically new only by its destruction and by the narrative of this destruction, I think to end is probably best exemplified by the Literaturwurst of the Hegel whole work. Roth here proposes a quite, this work is a series of Wurst which are made by the whole by the whole work of Hegel shred into Wurst. Roth here proposes a quite singular completion and overcoming of the totalizing system of Hegel philosophy. And here we get again to the punch to philosophy. If Marx's thesis on Feuerbach announced the overcoming of philosophy, of the system of philosophy by praxis, only to let us discover that this overcoming is a fundamental step of Hegel logic itself, it has been widely discussed. Roth, by shredding the whole work of Hegel into Wurst, does, does more than destroying it. It announces that the true overcoming of something can only take place in the narrative of its destruction, the narrative that of this destruction, here in the narrative of the different ends that a first can have, destroyed by rotting, if you don't eat it, or destroyed by digestion, if you eat it, but not certainly stabilized in a sculpture, musified, as this work ultimately, but also ironically, in fact, is. And somehow I like very much the word Literaturwurst because it puts together quite literally the idea of a narrative and the idea of a, something that has to be destroyed in a way or in another. What these examples show, all these examples show, I hope, is the possibility of a generative process based on the sole resources of an act of destruction be it obtained by voidance, revealing a saturated field of noisy phenomena, by intensification of element ending in a moment of radical fracture, like in the case of Reich, or by the narrative resources deployed by the rotting away of a state of fact. 
What one needs to look for is the very generative mechanics of destruction, I think, overcoming not only any form of determinate negativity, but also overcoming any alternation between a moment of destruction and the construction of then finding something new. What I wanted to stress is how starting from the internal resources of acts of violence and, violence and silencing, one can construct an imminent expressive field based on the sole resources of a destructive moment, on the sole performative capacity of what one can call a materiality of, this, of nothing. Voidance, saturation, and failure only indicate here some of the possible modes of development of operative, operative mode, the resources of, of which are large to be explored. And I think it is in the exploration of this field that one is to engage if she is seriously to answer the question, what is to be done?